case you hadn't noticed, we are uh, in the middle of a recession of sorts alongside Tom Masney from the Pennant Group. I'm Neil Gordon from Augusta Business Daily. I thought this might be a good time for us to take 20 or 30 minutes and just break down how this impacts our health coverage and employers and uh, employees as well. First of all, supply chain issues. Yeah, Neil. So I appreciate you having me on the show again um, to talk insurance. Not the most exciting topic, but you know, trying to wrap it all together and make insurance relevant to today. And with insurance um, going through a, a time of change in our market, um, the recession hitting our country and coming to our market is going to have an impact on insurance in one form or fashion, whether it's in premium increases or just cost increases to employees. Um, so I'm trying to make employers aware that uh, the recession is hitting and it's going to affect our benefits long term. Indeed. And on top of that, we've got a lot of consolidation going along in the medical space and um, probably a little less competition, I guess. Yeah. So our, fair? it's a fair, fair point. So our, our market is a, in a season of change mm -hmm. per se, but um, you know, I do want to touch base before I get into, you know, the consolidation aspect of our market and what's, what's happening here. Let's talk a little bit about supply chain mm -hmm. issues that we're seeing. So, you know, when you think health insurance, um, it's, it, it's not really a tangible object, right? I mean, it's, it's really you're paying for services. So we're not really seeing a whole lot in supply chain. But what we are seeing is companies are getting hit with their supply chain um, issues, not being able to get goods fast enough. Um, gas prices are going up. Interest mm -hmm. rates are going up. And that is going to have a trickle-down effect on employee benefits. So look at it this way is, you know, health care and employee benefits is probably a top two or three line item for most employers. Mm -hmm. um, most employers don't consider themselves in the healthcare business, but if you have an employee benefits plan and you offer health insurance, you are in the healthcare business because it's one of your largest expenses and you are paying a portion of that for your employees. So you are truly managing healthcare. Um, when we're seeing trickle down effect from prices increasing, that's gonna hit your employees in their back pocket. So not necessarily are your rates increasing, mm -hmm. but if we don't manage those rates, they're going to increase and that's going to have a trickle down effect because your employees are seeing rates go up at home. And now when they see their premiums go up coming out of their paycheck, we're going to have a bigger issue. Yeah. Everything is going up for everyone and it hits uh, pretty much every line item. Um, by the way, Tom has a lot of wonderful information on his website as well. And is a, a thought leader for us on AugustaBusinessDaily.com, and his website is ThePennantGroup.com. Um, we briefly touched on healthcare uh, consolidation. How does it relate to doctors and hospitals? Not doctors' hospital, but <laughs> both of those entities. Right. Yeah. So you know, Augusta prior to this year has been in a a, a good place for healthcare. We've had three independent. Uh, hospital systems. Uh, one was locally owned, um, so that mm -hmm. played a key role. And being in the state of Georgia, uh, we had competition from a carrier standpoint. So we call them the Bucas. All right. So you've got Blues, United, Cigna, Aetna, and in our market, we have Humana. So mm -hmm. those are the Bucas. Those are the five main national carriers that are across the country, and they all play in our market. Um, prior to this year, Cigna really wasn't a big player in our market. So we were really just dealing with, you know, the Blues United, um, Aetna, and Humana. Cigna had a very small play in our market today. Um, but over the last six months, we've had an outside entity come from Atlanta to a large regional 18 hospital system called Piedmont. Mm -hmm. Piedmont has now purchased University Hospital. Um, so University is no longer in our market, it is now Piedmont. So now we have three regional players and one national player in our market. So we've got Piedmont, which has 18 hospitals. We've got an HCA facility, which doctors. is Doctors Hospital, mm -hmm. and they're a national facility. Uh, and then we have the Medical College of Georgia. Um, I won't call them a local independent, even though it's a regional mm -hmm. hospital, but there's some talks um, that another outside entity may come to Augusta I've heard and, that. and purchase mm -hmm. um, another hospital here. And if that's the case, now we've got outside 
pressures coming to our market. Um, so prior to Piedmont coming here, we were in a really good place for cost of care. We had good competition from a provider standpoint and good competition from a carrier standpoint. So our cost of care, this goes back to the recession, right? Mm -hmm. Our cost of care was very low in our market. So, you know, um, when we look at the cost of a procedure, Medicare is 1.0. That's our baseline, right? So everything goes off of Medicare. Um, you know, providers have to take Medicare when they when they take it, and that is the reimbursement price that's set. That's 1.0. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking private insurance companies, they are always a percentage of Medicare. So it's 1.0 plus a percentage that's reimbursed. Um, our market reimbursed somewhere in the two to three times Medicare. So, you know, 200 to 300% of Medicare, mm -hmm. uh, which is a fair market market price. Uh, with Piedmont coming in, they're going to bring their Atlanta and regional pricing. Mm -hmm. So we all know that if you're living in a large city, the cost of living is, is higher. Um, so Piedmont's prices on, from a reimbursement standpoint are going to be higher than what we've typically seen. Um, so when they come to our market and they start putting pressure on providers um, for negotiated contracts, and they also put the pressure on the insurance company for their negotiated contract, we're going to see some changes. When we do see those changes, um, you know, so let's say a knee surgery that used to cost $35,000 may cost $70,000. We may not see that in our initial back pocket out of expense, but we're going to start seeing that in our premiums. And specifically for people watching us, what's the bottom line for employers in the Augusta Aiken area? Yeah, so, you know, when procedures start costing more, we're going to start paying more in our premiums. Okay. Um, our, our market here, we're in a transition. Um, my company, The Pennant Group, is helping employers go through a, a, a flip. We're taking a lot of fully insured business and moving into a self-funded arrangement um, so we can start seeing data and taking a proactive, controlled approach. But our market today lives in a fully insured, reactional situation. So we're always a year behind. So the claims that happen this year are going to be reflected in our premium costs next year. So employer groups that uh, used to run well because their cost of care was low are going to have behind the scenes higher costs on those procedures, which are going to trickle down and cause their premiums to go up. That trickles down to the employees, right? Because eventually employers are going to have to pass on some of that share. Mm -hmm. you know, their costs keep going up. They're going to have to pass it on to the employees. And unfortunately, the employees' costs are probably going to go up if we don't do something about it and start taking control. So you shared with us locally and regionally what is really impacting and the trickle-down effect. How about nationally? What's the biggest driver in what's going on nationally? Yeah, so, you know, there's been some legislation um, passed and talked about, and you may see it in the media, um, trying to get control of the pharmaceutical side, the prescription side of, of business um, and, and our industry, that is the number one driver of healthcare costs. And a lot of it is because the, the five BUCAs, the Blues, United, Cigna, Aetna, and Humana are starting to do vertical integration, right? So vertical integration is owning the entire supply chain from top to bottom, right? right? They own it from the time you go to the doctor and get a claim processed all the way through that supply chain to when you get that prescription filled. So I've got a short video that I think we'll watch that'll be pertinent to this. Um, we'll take a, a small break, watch the video, and then re reconvene on it. Okay. Hey boss, you got a second? Oh, hey Jimothy, yeah, what's up? Well, a lot of our customers are pretty upset about the cost of their prescription medications. <laughs> yeah, I bet. They're super high. Is there anything we can do to help bring that cost down? Oh, you're gonna have to talk to the pharmacy benefit manager about that. What is that? The pharmacy benefit manager, the PBM. Jimothy, did you not study your health insurance chain of command? The PBM negotiates discounts with the pharmaceutical companies. Oh, and then they pass those savings down to patients? Oh, God, no. Ugh. No, they pocket the money, reap enormous profits, which actually increases the cost of medications to patients. Really? Yeah. PBMs run every aspect of the drug market. They set prices and they determine which medications will be covered by your insurance, all to the highest bidder. Oh, 
God. Well, do you know where I can find one of these pharmacy benefit manage? What's happening right now? Hi, I'm the pharmacy benefit manager. I'm confused. Timothy, it's actually me, United Healthcare. Yeah, I know. You're also the pharmacy benefit manager? Yeah. Well, we go by Optum, but you know, it's all United Healthcare. Anything else you own? Oh, we have our own pharmacy, Optum RX. Yeah. All our customers have to use it. It's great. So, let me get this straight. The PBM, that's me, decides which medications are covered by health insurance. Also me. And which pharmacy, me again, the patient uses to get those medications. Vertical integration. We make $200 billion a year. It's awesome. Surely there's some kind of oversight, right? Somebody has to keep you accountable. You don't make $200 billion a year with oversight. How is any of this legal? Jimothy. When you make enough money, you get to write the laws. Well, who said health insurance wasn't fun? That guy was really, um, he was relatable, I, he, I guess. He would, I wish I could take credit for, the, for that yeah. video, right? But somebody, another colleague of mine um, shared that with us, and it just hit home. It made a little fun of, of our industry, but it's, it's true, and it's sad that, uh, you know, health insurance companies – yeah. If you look at the, the stock market for the last, you know, 10 to 20 years, it goes up and down. But what hasn't really decreased is the stock price of the publicly traded right. insurance companies. Yeah. They have just exploded ever since healthcare reform was put into place. Um, and no fault of theirs, but they've just taken advantage of a situation that that was presented to them. And they've started to purchase up and control the supply chain and they're forcing consumers without their knowledge mm -hmm. up through this path um, to control the prices. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do in our market and what I'm trying to do as a consultant is not necessarily expose them in a bad way, but really just to expose and uncover the transparency of healthcare and put back in control to the employers you know, how do we manage some of these costs? And we had talked about supply chain increases, gas increases at the grocery store. We know that things go up 5 10%, and, and it, it's kind of reasonable. But the numbers are astounding in the pharmaceutical industry. Yes, yeah. And, you know, I my wife pokes fun at me because I'll sit on the couch, and every time a commercial comes on, I'll – you know, take out my phone and I put into a, the good RX app. I don't know yeah. if you've seen that. But sure. The yellow card. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they have an app and I implore all of my clients to download it and uh, their employees to use it because the cost that you see on that is the cash price at every pharmacy in the area. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that cash price is less than your copay. Right. Mm -hmm. But I use it just to see what the cost of that medication is. So you know, I call them the TV drugs. It's all the, the, the commercials that you see at night. Right. Um, those costs of those medications are astounding. It blows my mind every time I see that. So there was a stat I read in the uh, Journal of American Medicine mm -hmm. Association, and it said basically I, I wrote the numbers down because I didn't want to get them wrong. Mm -hmm. But between 2008 and 2021, the average launch price of a drug, so when a new drug comes to market, right, mm -hmm. these are drugs that – um, help control, don't, don't cure, but control chronic diseases, mm -hmm. right? So the average drug launch price over that time span has increased 8,400%. You sure those two zeros are in there? It's not 84%? Even if it was 84%, that's a yeah. huge increase, right? 8,400? 8,400%. So in 2008, the average median price of a newly launched medication was $2,115. Okay, that's annually. So that's an expensive medication. When you when you peel it back, you're paying twenty to forty to thirty five dollars at the at the pharmacy. Yeah. But behind the scenes, you know, annually they're pay, you're paying over two thousand dollars. Right. Um, in two thousand twenty one, the average price of those medications, similar medications for chronic uh, disease management, one hundred and eighty thousand dollars annually. To me. The pharmaceutical industry needs some some control, right? It needs some transparency, which we're working on, but it also needs, you know, some stop gaps in there to manage these prices. 
Um, we could go down a bunch of different rabbit holes on how this affects your employer's um, you know, policy and your premiums and what games are being played in the background. But just know that when you're paying that copay, um, you know, great example is uh, SkyRizzy. SkyRizzy is a medication for um, psoriasis, a, you know, mm-hmm. a skin rash, skin condition. can be debilitating for some people, right? But this manages that chronic um, illness. That medication is $24,000 per script per month, right? So Whoa. you're paying $35, $150, $200 dollars every time for that medication, which is a lot of money. But behind the scenes, your employer's plan is spending the rest of that that money and spending twenty four thousand dollars. That's what's affecting the cost of our overall premium. And that's what we need to get some transparency on and that's what we need to get control of. We're continuing with Tom Masney, he's a former major league baseball pitcher who kind of want to help, wants to be part of your employee benefit team. His company is aptly called the Pennant Group, very well done. And online, it's thepennantgroup.com. Really great information. And that's kind of where we're going as we continue on this. You know, knowledge is power. It is. So what kind of information should employers really be learning? Yeah. You know, so as we move down this path of exposing what the true cost of healthcare is and what's driving those costs, you know, I think it's, it's vital that we try and take control of it, right? So we know what's happening in our market, right? A recession has hit, costs are going up. There's been integration between healthcare systems. Um, We're in a state of turmoil. We can no longer live in a reactive situation. We have to be proactive and we have to take control of our situation. And what control looks like for every employer group is is different, right? So what works for a 500 life group Mm-hmm. does not necessarily work for a 10 life group, mm-hmm. but the concept of taking action and taking control of it and being proactive works across the board. Are there some tools that maybe um, are out there in terms of research that employers can do? Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are. And it's, to me, there's no one, one way to approach mm-hmm. this, right? But, you know, I have on hand a couple different methods that I like to implore on, on some of these groups, I think first and foremost is a conversation with the employer group of what we're trying to do with our benefits program. Why do we have it to begin with? Mm -hmm. Are you, do you have it just because you're forced to because of uh, healthcare reform stating that any applicable large employer, 50 employees or above has to offer it or they get a penalty, right? Are we offering it just to offer it or are we truly offering it for a value add Um, to attract and retain top talent. So I think defining why we're offering the benefits package is key. And then from that point, we determine what's the most important aspect of it. Okay, fair enough. Um, Are there sort of some, um, for lack of better words, questionnaires? Are there some surveys? Are there some things um, folks can do independently? Yes, there are. Um, so you asked that question, and I didn't answer because I was rambling and going down my, okay. own, my own rabbit no, holes, no, no. right? But no, so to circle back to that, uh, you know, I think, you know, not only is it important to understand why from an employer standpoint we're offering the coverage, but we under- need to understand from an employee standpoint of what's important, right? So we got to come at it from from two okay. angles. Um, and then we have to try and mirror the two, right? So we have to understand why we're offering it, what the employees want, and then ultimately you have to hit a budget number, right? So yeah. I think that at the end of the day, we can't continue to offer this if it's going to drive our uh, us into bankruptcy. So, you know, I like to do a survey with all of my groups, um, you know, and that survey is more from an employee standpoint, right? We've already had a conversation from an employer standpoint of what we would like to accomplish, mm-hmm. you know, what our one-year goal is and what our two- to five-year wish list okay. would be. Um, but – we need to make that aligned to what the employees expect. So I think a survey is a great resource just to ask them, do they understand their benefits program and do they value it? And then if not, what don't they like about it? What do they expect in it? Because if we don't have those answers, we're just kind of throwing darts at the wall and hoping something sticks. So, 
you know, surveys, surveys are key. Surveys are important. Um, you know, another tool that we have is medical questionnaires. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, back before healthcare reform kicked in, you know, they would, carriers would come with a sheet of paper and you'd have to fill out all of your medical questionnaires and there would be a different one for each carrier and say, what are your conditions that you have over the last five years? Mm -hmm. And we need to fill that out so we can underwrite your group and give us, you know, what kind of risk. Well, now we have tools that you can present. They're all digital, online, through a phone, through a computer, doesn't matter. Um, takes you five to 15 minutes. Um, you answer the questions and that then populates onto all of the carrier's you know, medical questionnaires, so then we can take the market. But what that also does is gives us a um, some reporting on the group without without names, you know, so we don't want to break HIPAA, but gives us reporting so we know what is in the group, so then we know what funding mechanism makes sense for the company. Um, a newest, latest, and greatest tool that we're starting to see in our market uh, takes a deeper dive into the medical questionnaires, but it's less intrusive. Um, this actually dives into EOBs, mm -hmm. right? So most people say, what's an EOB, right? So it's an explanation of benefits. Okay. So you probably get those in the mail. You go see your provider, you pay your copay. and What, then, did, what did I have done? What yeah. work did I have done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then three weeks later, you get this uh, confusing statement in the, in the mail. It says, this is not a bill, but it breaks down what right. the cost was and what your insurance company paid for. So that's your EOB. Well, what this technology does is with your permission from an employee's permission, um, the technology logs into their, their system, their um, health insurance system, right? Mm -hmm. And it pulls their statements, it pulls their EOBs and gathers them. And then it creates reports based off of true conditions, what medications they're on, how much they're using, what surgeries they've had. Um, and then takes those to the carrier. So it's eliminating the in-between where we're mm -hmm. having to intrusively ask uncomfortable conversations and questions, but it's truly gathering real information that we can take to the health insurance companies and say, this is what our group looks like. Right, rate our group according to the conditions that we have, not what you think we have. I love that data. Is that, is that a, are you able to use that data for companies that might qualify for self-funding mm -hmm. or self-insurance? Yeah, you. I mean, you can use it for a myriad of different um, reasons. I mean, whether you're fully insured, whether you're self-funded, what this is, it's just, it's knowledge, right? Um, I've got a cartoon that uh, I, we're gonna pop on the screen yeah. here in a second. And the quote is that, I, that goes along with it, right? It's a thinker and there's a doer, right? So it's, you know, my quote that I like to put underneath this is from Aristotle, right? The the purpose of knowledge is not knowledge, it's action, right? So I'm not, I don't want just knowledge and data just because I want to do something with it, right? The key is to get that data, analyze it, and then put it into a proactive approach to benefits, right? Actively manage your benefits costs because like we stated earlier, you are in the healthcare business. If you're offering a plan, you're in the healthcare business and you need to manage that supply chain. And you and that's taking control, sort of flipping the script on the old, the way everything used to be done yep. and making a change. Yeah, and it's yeah. it takes time, right? And it, it's nothing is easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a meeting with, with a group the other day um, and they're frustrated with their health insurance. And they mm -hmm. said, we, we want to move. We want to move. We want to get rid of this. And we want to move on to something else. Well, I said, well, why are we upset? What's frustrating us? And where do you think we should move? Mm -hmm. And their answer to all of those were, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to move. And I don't know where to take this, right? So that's where we come in and we say, well, all right, well, let's uncover this. Let's have the conversation of what are we trying to accomplish? And then what do your employees need? What are the pain points that we are trying to truly fix? We need to take this in incremental steps. We can't just snap our fingers and fix it. All of the issues on day one, we have to take a methodical approach to accomplish this over time. Yeah. And listen, we're, uh, we're creatures of habit. 
sometimes we don't like to change. Uh, but what do they say? The definition of insanity is you do the same thing over and over. You want different results. How, so how hard is it? Maybe walk us through the steps of making changes in the entire process for the employee benefit package. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because it's it is scary, right? Change is uncomfortable. Change can be scary, um, even if it's a necessary evil, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to step out of their comfort zone because it's working, right? And if you make a change, it could disrupt it. Um, not only for you from a financial standpoint, because claims aren't getting paid or, you know, there's a lapse in coverage, but there's a disruption to your employees if it's not handled correctly. And that trickles down, right? So, you know, to me, when we're looking at a change, whether that's changing insurance providers, changing your plans or changing your consultant, you know, if, as long as you take a proactive approach and you address what the pitfalls are going to be, then it should be done smoothly. But if you don't address it and you just hide behind it, that's when things are going to uh, fall through the cracks. That's when issues are going to arise. So um, let's discuss changing um, an insurance provider, mm -hmm. right? So we talked about the BUCAs, right? Blues, United, Cigna, Aetna, and Humana. Uh, this year, we've seen a big drastic change in our market. So Humana, if we were an under 50 employer group, Humana was the, the cost leader. They had most of our business in our market. Uh, in 2021, uh, Cigna came into our market. A lot of that was because of Piedmont coming in. So mm -hmm. Piedmont uses Cigna. Um, they're their largest um, employee employer group in the state of Georgia. Okay. And they use Cigna as their uh, network of choice. So they came into our market, and now Cigna – is starting to buy up business, right? They're coming in with lower rates, um, comparable plan designs, and enticing employer groups to move, right? It's all it's it's cyclical, so they may be the the cost leader for you know four to five years, mm -hmm. and then somebody else will come in and buy buy business. But this was a major year of change um, from an insurance provider standpoint. So how that happens and how that occurs is. We typically get a renewal 60 days out. Okay. Okay. We should be looking at our insurance 90 days out prior to the renewal so that we don't get caught uh, off guard, right? We don't want to just say, oh, no, we got our renewal. Now what? We want to have a proactive plan that says when we get our renewal, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to get our renewal. We're going to decide, hey, this is not where we need to be. We're making a switch. Um, so at that point, we notify the new carrier that we are switching to them and we okay. get that process rolling. Any set notice period to give them? For the new carrier, the, the longer you can give them, the better, right? So okay. you can you can actually install a group in um, you know 15 days, okay. right? So if you're a January 1st effective date, you could get it enrolled December 15th and still be okay. You could get it enrolled the last of the month, and it would still have coverage, but there would be a huge lapse, and it would be a nightmare. Um, we we want to get everything to the new carrier 45 days or more, right? So we want to be as proactive as possible. 45 days, we, inf we inform the new carrier, this is where we're going. These are the plans that we've selected, and we start getting the paperwork going. In the meantime, we, we write a letter to the incumbent carrier and okay. say, effective this date, we are canceling and terming coverage. Um, that notifies them to not send out new ID cards because that can cause confusion. Oh, yeah. um, and that also gives them time to wrap everything up, right? So we want to give both parties ample time um, to kind of make that decision. Sure. Now, let's put an asterisk next to it. Let's, let's say we're really late in the game for some reason. Um, we just could not make up our mind or we got a last minute quote mm -hmm. and we're really far in the game and we don't want to mess things up. You do have the ability to terminate with that carrier right when coverage terms. So you don't necessarily give them the preemptive term mm -hmm. because if the other one doesn't get installed in time, we still want there to be coverage. That's right. Right. So it all depends on the timing of when we do it. But if we can make our moves 45 days out, we should be fine from a from a carrier standpoint. But the more transparent you can be 
and the more upfront you can be, the better off you're going to be. But it's really all done with just the signing of a pen on a letter, oh, wow. company letterhead, or term and coverage, and you move on to the new so carrier. So change is, change is not that hard. Uh, but let's say, you know, Tom Smith was my health insurance account representative for, for a company, and I want to switch over to the pennant group. Do I have to have a conversation with Tom Smith to do that? It's a loaded question, right? Okay. So to me, it depends on your relationship with, okay. with your broker, right? If the broker hasn't done anything bad, mm -hmm. um, hasn't done anything underhanded, um, it's just time to make a change. You know, I think it's it's just common courtesy that you have that business conversation with that broker okay. of, hey, you know, no fault of yours, but we're going in a different direction. Um, you know, and that's just the ethical, moral way to do things, in, in my opinion, Sure, um, but you don't have to have that conversation. Um, switching brokers is is a really easy uh, process in our industry. Um, property and casualty, you know, uh, general liability, workers comp, um, home, auto, um, it works a little bit different. Um, right. The switch is pretty easy, but we in our benefits world, we shop at the same Walmart, right? So, mm. Neil, if you're a consultant and I'm a consultant, what products and what coverages we're bringing to the table, we all have access to. There's going to be those, um, those hidden ones that only we have exclusivity on, but those are really far, few and far between. For the most part, we're going to have access to the exact same, same carriers, same coverage, same policy, same pricing. Um, so, you know, for that standpoint, if you want to switch consultants, you put on your company letterhead, you sign it, and basically it's a letter to the insurance company stating, hey, I would like to use Neil as my benefits consultant effective this date. And then behind the scenes, they just switch everything over. Okay. You know, it's pretty painless. It's pretty simple. Um, it can be done. If it's not done the right way, it can get ugly from a personal standpoint, right? But from a business standpoint, behind the scenes, you don't see anything different. Your, care, your coverage just goes from being managed by Tom to being now managed by Neil, and your policies just transfer over, and there's no lapse in any coverage. Great idea. Well, I appreciate all the insight, and uh, we have had a little fun, right? We had a, a, a good video and some cartoons, and but it, it, it's serious business, but it's a way for someone to maybe um, look at look at what you're doing and take another look and, and maybe save some money and gain some benefits. And I think it's, uh, it's wonderful. And, uh, we appreciate you. Neil, always a pleasure to talk insurance. I know it's not an exciting topic, but, uh, you know, one that's vital and that we need to get on top of. And it's the pennantgroup.com, the pennantgroup.com. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Neil.